Our topic tonight is Kenya, of course, uh, U.S.-Kenyan relations. Um, nearly everybody in this room knows a student who has gone to Kenya during their junior year abroad. It's a <clears throat> very popular uh, uh, place to go for many American college students. And uh, as everybody in the room knows also, uh, Kenya is a kind of a centerpiece of East Africa. Her neighbors cause a lot of problems. For some of us, uh, their neighbor of Sudan, of course, and southern Sudan is a, a matter of great concern, not only to Kenya, but to us. Somalia, Uganda, the Con northern Congo, and Rwanda. There have been areas that have been in the headlines. Uh, but perhaps most important, uh, we share with Kenya uh, an interest in economic and social development uh, in the region. And Kenya is certainly one of the leaders of the East African region. Uh, it's a commercial center, uh, a large and successful country. The ambassador uh, has been active in a variety of civic affairs within Kenya. I mentioned his interest in uh, coping with the AIDS problem. He's uh, been uh, a president's uh, representative for special uh, projects within the country. More recently, he has served as the high commissioner to Canada and the ambassador to Cuba. And at the present time, he serves as ambassador to the United States and Mexico and Colombia. <laughs> you thought it was a big deal to be president, uh, the ambassador to the United States, you see. And his burdens are, are even greater. Uh, it's a country that interests us, and we have a lot of shared interests. It's a great pleasure to present Ambassador Peter Ogego. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And I want to thank all of you uh, who have braved the last part of winter to come out and listen to me. <laughs> it is indeed a great honor to me, for me to be here uh, at your invitation, Mr. President, and by the Board of Trustees of the Baltimore Council of Foreign Affairs and at this very magnificent view of, of the river. Uh, I, I know that on a clear day, it must be breathtaking like some of the landscapes we have in Kenya. I do hope that I will measure up to your expectations and to the already very high standards set by my predecessors. I'm also indeed very grateful for the honor and privilege that you have accorded me to speak about my country, Kenya which is currently undergoing major constitutional reform debate and readying herself for a new political dispensation and to make a few remarks on the historical bilateral relations that we have and continue to enjoy with your great nation, the United States of America, in, the, in this distinguished uh, presence. May I also, through you all, register profound gratitude to the city and people of, the, of Baltimore for the welcome and hospitality extended to Kenyans who live and raise their family here in neighborhoods they now call home, away from home, 
and for making it possible for professional Kenyans who work within your city, within your municipality, to fulfill their dreams, realize their full potentials and capacities, and to develop their talents and skills. I also wish to sincerely thank Mr. President uh, uh, Frank uh, for inviting me today and for the wonderful courtesies and receptions in my honor. Uh, I want to give you a pleasant surprise that there are many Kenyans in the U.S. And this started in the 50s with what is commonly uh, known as the airlift which was a negotiation between your former President Kennedy and one of our leading nationalist leaders of the time, the late Tom Boyer, who had a vision to identify potential Kenyan students at that time, send them abroad, equip them uh, with education in readiness for our independence in the, in the early 60s. And so since 1958, 59, 1960, 61 up to 63, when we got independence, we have had a steady stream of Kenyan students coming over to the US. And today, Kenya leads in the number of international students from Africa at a rate of over 7,000 students per annum. Uh, I just came back from a trip of the Midwest yesterday. I visited about seven universities. And in, in most of those universities, Kenyans are the leading students from Africa. I was at Park University, where we have 84 students from Kenya. I was at KU. KU is um, a Kansas City University. Uh, Kenyan students would be the majority from Africa. There is Kenashaw State University in Georgia, where majority of students are Kenyans. And there are many, many universities across this nation <coughs> where Kenyans are the majority from Africa. We compete favorably with Nigerians, but I think right now we are ahead of them. <laughs> and so you have the best of us because our people send their children to acquire the best education in the world today in the US. And so we have a lot of attachment to the US as a country. And you may not know, but there are lots of and deeper cultural educational relationship between us Kenyans and the United States outside the official business between government to government. And the Kenyans in the US form the largest of our diaspora. And our diaspora has been very important to us in terms of remittances, in terms of foreign exchange, in terms of skilled manpower, know-how, technology, financial capital, and investment. In recent years, uh, uh, precisely in 2007, uh, the diaspora made immense contribution to the real estate investment in Kenya and contributed one billion US dollars that year alone. Well, amongst the community of nations and around global issues, Kenya has been a well-known and long-standing friend and ally of your great country, the United States of America. And over the years, since the attainment of our independence, Kenya and the US have enjoyed warm and cordial relations, which have stood the test of time. Recently, in our presidential election countdown, we had an internal crisis. The U.S. stood with us. And even today, as we undergo major constitutional review and reform and debates, the U.S stands with us. We stay engaged. We discuss, even if we have some issues at the table, we discuss, discuss them as old friends and allies. <clears throat> A 
And these bilateral relations, cooperation, and partnership between our two countries are premised upon shared values of market-oriented economic growth policies and democratic principles and institutions. And the realization of civil liberties and freedoms while supporting vibrant media and a dynamic civil society. I always say that Kenyans are good students of America. We hold the US as our model. Uh, one would have expected that we should have looked towards London, but no, I'm, I'm afraid uh, the US has been our model. I just told you about the education processes that has been going on. That has huge influences and for many years. And even overall, we want to measure ourselves to the American standards. So the levels of freedom, the levels of liberties are as high, as, as open as they are here in, in the US. And those of you who know about Kenya, who have been to Kenya, uh, will attest to this. <coughs> It is these kinds of relationships and partnerships amongst our two peoples that will easily become our fallback positions and moderating factors for both of us as old friends and allies, even when we have to deal with the tough and delicate issues across the table, like we sometimes do. Uh, currently, there are issues of the pace of reforms, different perceptions, some people who know Kenya very well, who know Africa, are comfortable with the pace at which we are handling the reforms. Others may be a little bit impatient, thinking it's very easy to uh, rally members of parliament to pass a vote. Uh, if you have been closer to any Congress, you will know how sometimes difficult it is. <laughs> and Kenya is not different. But even when we have different views about common issues, we still reach out to each other as friends because we have that long tradition. It is also noteworthy for you that your embassy in Kenya is the largest US government diplomatic mission in sub-Saharan Africa, representing over 18 federal agencies with nearly 1,300 US employees and happily contributing about $1.5 billion to our economy through goods, sale of goods and services. And it, it, it also has programs that bring to the US closer to 200 Kenyans for training and for educational purposes uh, through the various US government agencies. And so you can see that we stand alone, I think apart from Cairo in the north and maybe South Africa, the entire sub-Saharan Africa relies very heavily uh, on Kenya when it comes to many other international issues. Issues of immigration, issues of security, um, background checks from all the way from South Africa to far north uh, would be checked in Nairobi. Our economic relations with the US has largely been in favor of the US. Um, as would be expected. Uh, but last year, because there were little imports by us and more exports, particularly apparel, uh, we are trying to minimize the deficit. The US still remains our biggest, our, uh, and the potential is a huge uh, trading partner. It is today the third after Uganda which is our first trading partner in the neighborhood. And 
the UK, uh, who still buy the bulk of our products, particularly tea, black tea. Uh, you know, the English breakfast tea is largely a Kenyan tea. <laughs> and vegetables that we export uh, to the European market. Uh, the US is also a major source market for us, for tourism, having surpassed Germany. And so it would be the UK who would send most of the tourists to Kenya and the US. And because of the US population, there's a huge potential uh, for US to take their rightful position, which would be number one. So we hope that uh, when you finally retire and uh, have some time, uh, you can come to Kenya and enjoy our beaches. Your investment, the US investment in Kenya stands at about half a billion. In some of the major flagships, traditional ones would be General Motors, we have them in Kenya, Coca-Cola, the largest facility of Coca-Cola is actually in Nairobi for the entire African region. We have the Citibank, Alico, American Life uh, Insurance Company, which has been there uh, ever since I was born. Express Kenya, uh, which is uh, a subsidiary of uh, uh, the American company. In terms of development cooperation, we are beneficiaries of MCC, the Millennium Challenge Cooperation, the Threshold Program. We are working closely towards the compact. And we have such programs like PEPFA, Malaria Initiative, and all the other major programs that your government uh, has put forward to help African countries with. We have very vibrant defense relations, military relations with the US, uh, dating back to uh, our independence days. And we buy your equipment. We work very closely uh, with your security and intelligence agencies. Kenya, incidentally, is host to a number of international organizations, including the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, United Nations Habitat, and is also home to some of the most critical multilateral organizations, such as World Food Program, the UNDP, UNESCO, WHO, UNHCR, UNAIDS, UNICEF, where the US government has the largest shareholding and budget contributions in those UN organizations. And Nairobi then becomes the host for these UN bodies. Kenya is also a regional headquarter for many international corporations and agencies. All the major news agencies, the CNN, uh, whatever you have, have their regional hubs in the region. We are also an air transport flight hub for Africa. The Kenya is a clear regional economic leader and center for regional capital markets. The Nairobi Stock Exchange is electronically linked to the rest of the other bourses within the East African com community. Uh, we have regional services for telecommunications, for banks, medical services, and we are an emerging center for call centers, uh, having laid down the fiber optic recently from the Middle East, from Fujaira in Middle East to the coast part of Mombasa. So we have connectivity. Uh, uh, within Kenya and also within the region. Uh, we are a lead producer of black tea, uh, sold largely to, 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 to UK. Uh, 
you may not know, but we supply a third of wild cut flowers. The ladies who love roses, we do a third of wild requirement of Valentine roses. And uh, we recently, uh, three years ago, uh, during my term, launched a flower market in Miami. And every year, annually in March, next month, we bring flowers from Kenya uh, at, to the flower show. And they compete very favorably with their counterparts from down south. Uh, and the joke there is that the Kenyan flowers, having traveled for two hours from the farm to the airport and flown eight hours into Europe and another seven, six, seven into Miami and almost three days of rehabilitation and stabilization. And after a week long show, still stand out and we give them out to ladies as bouquets and they stand, you know, smelling nice and without drooping. Um, <laughs> So, because the shelf life of, of our flowers uh, is longer than any other. And, and I would recommend uh, uh, those of, of you who want to try out. Yeah. So, so most of the flowers that go to Amsterdam, uh, where is, there is a warehouse that finally finds its way into the US, uh, are actually from our region, from Kenya and, and, and Ethiopia. We are a lead producer of uh, AA coffee, which as you know is used for blending. It's only Kenya and Colombia, uh, and we have a partnership with our Colombian uh, counterparts uh, to maintain that high quality. Uh, it's expensive to buy alone, so those who buy it, buy it mixed with, with other varieties of coffee. And of course, Germany would be the largest uh, buyer of our, of our coffee. Uh, we are also a lead producer of pyrethrum, used for the manufacturing of insect sites. And we are an agricultural country. The equator passes through us. The altitudes are high enough to moderate the higher temperatures. So Nairobi is a good place to live in, and we like it there. Within the region, I think we still stand tall as a leading democracy in Africa, and as a beacon of hope and stability in a region, as Mr. President said, that has been ravaged by political upheavals. The region is also a concern to us. Uh, as it is to the U.S. Uh, Sudan has a referendum coming next year. Uh, there seems to be a build-up in tension between South and North, and we are positioning ourselves for any eventualities. Our neighbor, Somali, um, is not settled yet, um, but we are stuck with them. We've it's like having bad relatives, you know, you can't do anything with them. <laughs> and we can't intervene because it, it would be awkward. Uh, but we have helped them, we still help them, we wish them well. We work with our international partners like the U.S. to help them find their bearing and to restore peace and stability there. Kenya has been committed to regional peace and stability and has invested heavily in peace processes through the sub-region. Uh, we brokered the Sudanese peace process in, in, in Kenya. We invited the Somali leaders into Kenya, hosted them for three months almost in hotels, helped them to elect one of their own to become the leader and the president and whatever, and then sent them back. It didn't help much, but we have, we still help paying the bills. We, uh, some of them caused trouble there and ran back to, to Kenya until we said, no, we will flush you out. And if you make problems there, we will, will not allow you to come back into Kenya. But very complex and very tricky situation. 
we keep investing, and we hope that someday there, there will be some peace. It's a leadership role that we cannot shy away from and which we must shoulder on with. We've been working with the international partners, including the US, to ensure a safe and secure region. <coughs> and we have provided leadership in finding peaceful resolution to the Sudan and Somali conflicts. We are playing a leading role on the issues of piracy along <coughs> the sea line, which is an international trade corridor for many years, uh, linking the West and the East uh, through the Indian Ocean. And uh, we have this uh, an enviable task of having to deal with these pirates, particularly when we arrest them. Uh, it's a role we are playing, and we cannot uh, run away from it. So that's who we are. Uh, uh, I needed to have mentioned that the, the airlift that I talked about earlier is what perhaps uh, influenced the father of your current president to come over to the U.S. There were many Kenyans of this generation uh, who came over in pursuit uh, of studies. So we have a lot of graduates from Harvard. We have a lot of graduates from Yale, from all your famous universities of that time and subsequently uh, up to today. And, and, and if there's any message uh, I want to leave you with tonight uh, is that Kenya is different from any of those other African countries with regards to uh, relations with the U.S. Uh, there has been a consistent pattern of flow of, of Kenyan elite in terms of the youth coming to pursue education and who either settle here or go back to Kenya or elsewhere around the world as part of the international professional cadre. At the World Bank alone today, I think we have over 200 Kenyans uh, who work there as professionals. The country director for World Bank in South Africa is a Kenyan, and I think another country, a country member. So you have Kenyans uh, who have made it. We are hardworking people. Uh, we are God-fearing. Uh, we are family-oriented people. Uh, we are hospitable people. Uh, we work hard, and uh, we also play hard. I want to stop there and field any questions that there may be. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, that comprehensive overview and for the positive uh, message. We, we appreciate that. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Yes, ma'am. Would you uh, add further comments on the agricultural sector, please? Thank you. Um, agriculture is our main mainstay, so to speak. Uh, over 60 percent of our population uh, live off agriculture or on agriculture. And our agricultural system is fairly developed compared to our neighbors. Uh, in some ways, uh, we lost. Uh, we did not concentrate on our, our strength because we used to export beef. We used to export butter. We used to, uh, together with the vegetables that I talked about, but I think we diversified and, and went to other um, more lucrative uh, areas because cut flowers, for instance, is well paying, but it's, it's a recent phenomenon. So we lost out on other areas, but largely uh, we, we still uh, invest heavily in agriculture, um, in milk production, uh, we produce rice. Uh, the point that we want to make uh, with regards to this is that because of the, the drought that we have had over the last four years, we are embarking on, on irrigation. And currently, we are exploring ways and means of doing full-scale, you know, large-scale irrigation programs for, for agriculture. And we are delighted that the, the U.S. current policy 
uh, towards Africa, towards supporting Africa, is putting more emphasis on food production uh, through, uh, through agriculture and, and using irrigation. Thank you. There's been a report in the New York Times that, that your prime minister and president are in some disagreement. Uh, they countermand each other. And uh, there are some details I know in the New York Times of, about that. And uh, how does this affect uh, your general problem of creating a new constitution? And how, what impact does it have upon uh, uh, the fight against corruption? Well, thank you. Uh, that must have been news. And you know, it's, it's, it's enlightening that the, the New York Times picked it, you know. At least Kenya is in the news. It just confirms what I said earlier. I mean, we're the only country in Africa you'd know anything about. <laughs> <laughs> we talk, we talk so loudly uh, that uh, uh, nobody can escape it. But the, the situation is, is not a crisis. We are under a coalition, which is something really new. And luckily, it only has a term. It cannot extend beyond 2012. In the coalition, the prime minister has the duty of coordinating government activities. And I think he kind of overstepped his mandate in a political uh, strategy. And uh, of course, the president is the head of state and head of government. Uh, so he simply uh, advised him otherwise. That must have caused big news. But Kenyans take it in their stride as part of the day-to-day -day internal bickerings <coughs> over coalition. Uh, but it did not uh, cause any star or any disruption. And people went, kids went to school. Traffic was as packed as the one in Baltimore. And uh, <laughs> people had their lunch. And uh, uh, with regards to whether this could interfere with the constitutional review, we, we are very vigilant. I need to tell the audience that the proposal that the Parliamentary Select Committee has is to adapt the US system of government, as it is. Well, <laughs> this is how keenly we are students of the US. I just told you, <laughs> in which, simply put, those who want to be in politics will go into politics and present themselves for election. And those who want to be in the government will wait until they're appointed into the government so that we have checks and balances. And. Kenyans would not smile if you shook your head against that decision because of the experience we have gone through. We've had a situation in which the president is both the head of government, but also head of state, which was a combination of the American presidential system as well as the British monarchical Westminster model. And so the president has his foot in the parliament, in the legislature, which means he can come and do a political battle with you. But if you beat him, he can retreat to his executive uh, office and issue executive orders. And that has brought us problems. So Kenya has come of age. And please wish us well, <laughs> we think we can manage to have a group of people who will pre prefer themselves to the electorate to be elected, to become lawmakers, and those that will be appointed to go to the executive under the president to discharge the duties of the executive branch, and those who will be in the judiciary to interpret the laws. We think. So that's the way forward for us. So we are very vigilant that these brinkmanships 
this new political uh, agitation from either side of the political aisle will not derail Kenyans from what they have decided they're going to have. Yeah, so, so we are very alert to it. Uh, these are the uh, unavoidable embarrassments that we must go through as a country for now. But, but at least we are civil enough. We will be able to uh, see them for what they are and, and, and look over them. Thank you. Would you uh, comment upon radical Islam? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I, as I said, you know, we are stuck with uh, a failed state that is, is almost 100% Islamic. We also have Muslims in Kenya. But majority of Muslim, Muslims in Kenya are moderate Muslims. And they have lived with us uh, ever since. But we are alert to those trends. And we have worked closely uh, with the international community uh, to stay safe and uh, flush out or keep off any radicals that might either sneak in or start brewing problems into the country. Uh, Kenya is largely Christian. Islam is a very small percentage. In fact, our concern is that we hope the Christian population will not reach a stage in which they are overtaken by xenophobia. Yeah, that, that might be something. So, so the threat may not be, to us it's not so much the, 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 the Islamists. Uh, they are not um, a large population to cause a threat. It is their persistent irritation to a largely peaceful Christian and moderate Muslim relation that might provoke uh, a reaction against them. But so far, uh, I think we are fine. Um, other than Somali itself, uh, even Sudan, it, it's not so much visible. Tanzania has a lot of Muslims as well. They're all peaceful. Uganda has Muslims. Um, there used to be a problem there in the 90s. But I think they've, they've from Sudan, uh, with, with, the, with the radicalization. But that was flushed out uh, uh, pretty, pretty harshly. And, and we're just alert to them. We, we want to enjoy our, our peace and freedoms and the cordial relations that exist between the many religions in Kenya, uh, Christian, Christianity, um, Islam. We have Hindus in Kenya. We have Buddhists. We have a, lot, a large Ismaili community uh, who are moderate Muslims. We have a lot of Kenyan Asians uh, whose families came over 100 years ago with the British. And they have lived in Kenya, and they practice their faith without any interference. And we went to the same schools. We go to the same restaurants. And there has never been uh, any religious animosity amongst the population. And so everybody is very alert, including the moderate Muslims, that the radicals do not come in. Recently, there was a Jamaican cleric who sneaked into the country and we arrested him and uh, locked him up. And we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't have any country through which he would pass to go back to his home. Uh, we finally had to charter a plane to take him back to his home. Uh, uh, so that's how serious uh, it is for us. Thank you. What uh, is the nature of your military relationship with the United States? Yes, we have, uh, and for many years. Uh, I made in my overview remarks, uh, I deliberately didn't want to go into details for obvious reasons, but we do have. Uh, we have uh, 
some of our officers train. Uh, I think we have two now at uh, uh, in Tampa. We have uh, in your major training facilities. Uh, some are in Djibouti. Uh, we cooperate in counter terrorism uh, programs. Uh, so officers come here, we uh, commit them to requisite training and uh, they go back and we work very closely um, with regards to the regional um, uh, flashpoints. We, we, we cooperate very, very closely, uh, both at the military, security and intelligence. The um, question deals with unrest associated with uh, your last election, and the question was, what are you doing to cope with that situation, which has a number of facets, of course, but what are you doing to deal with the kind of problem which uh, uh, was lodged within your last elections and which flowed from them? Well, I, I want to give you two sets of answers. One is, which I always avoid saying, is, is, is the problem in Kenya, which we are dealing with now, is is an accumulation of problems during the Cold War period when we the, the and the international community is, has a share of blame here. We supported leaders that were not working for their communities. And so institutions eroded over a period of time. What we have been trying to do over the last five, six years is to rehabilitate those institutions. You all know that even if you had the best leader on earth, even as good as an angel, we didn't have institutions, strong, accountable institutions, then that leader would never perform. So we are very alert to this. We know where we are going, but we are also very sensitive to where we are coming from. Because the Kenyan people are great people. They're hardworking people. The families who raise their kids to go to school. But it's the leadership that has always let them down. And so we are dealing with a backlog of institutional erosion, institutional rot within the police, within the judiciary, within every sector. And so we have been regaining ground, recovering. And the election that failed was a sad testimony to how weak those institutions were. Kenyans woke up, and it was over 90% turnout, voter turnout, peaceful, 90%. The elections themselves were very violent, you know, the youth, and so the election, the campaign. But on the election day, total peace. People went to vote. So the problem started when the votes now were being counted, which means that the, the institutions for democracy, the public institutions that guarantee democracy, security agencies, the Kenya Electoral Commission, and all the other agencies failed Kenya at the most crucial hour of need. And it is those institutions we want to revamp. I just came back from a trip uh, yesterday from Midwest and uh, in Nebraska uh, with a group from the Interim Independent Electoral Commission of Kenya looking at poll books, voting machines, uh, vote counters, the entire equipment of election machinery. And we want to buy them in readiness for 2012. So we, we are alert to it. We know, we, and, and we know that if the elections went well, Kenya would be on the other side of the scale. Thank you. Well, well would you comment yeah, on, would on comment your power you. to uh, prevent uh, yeah. well, atrocities? No, I, I think she made a very important <coughs> observation because what happened in Kenya was a shock to us as well because we are not used to violence. We've been conducting elections forever. Well, there could be skirmishes here and there, particularly amongst the youthful supporters of parties. 
But as I said, on the election day, and when votes are counted, nothing like that. And so after a point, Kenyans realized what's going on here. Why should we be able to fight each other? We never fought before. And so everybody reached out, the private sector, the churches, the, all the other institutions, the NGOs. And within two months, exactly on February the 28th, from January 28th, so December 28th, January 20th, Feb 28th, that whole black chapter was closed in our history. And a deal was made, and nobody has ever fought since then. So that's Kenya for us. Well, that's the Kenya we knew. But I must add that there was a lot of vested interest in those elections. A lot of it. From the Europeans, and we know, lots of stakes. You have seen your elections, how heavy it is, how heavily financed it is. The Kenyan election was just like an American election. We hired PR firms from the US to man headquarters, to man regional centers. It was, I mean, candidates campaigned with helicopters. It, it, it was just like any election here, just, just like in one state. A lot of vested interest, both from inside, but also externally. And these are lessons that we learned. We, we just have to own our country, and we try it this time around. Thank you. The, uh, the question springs from the reality that you have a, a large number of different tribal groups. The Kikuya right. having been the best known to most Americans. Yeah. The question, I think, is uh, what is the nature of those tribal relationships and how do they impact upon your elections and life in general? Well, I said no deliberately because I never subscribed to this school of tribalization of, of countries. Uh, I, I don't think that those Kenyans that I know are either Luos or Kikuyus or Maasai's or this or that. Uh, in fact, I could challenge anybody, especially scholars, that the intermarriage between the communities in Kenya is so far and deep that you may never, in, in the coming years, tell who is who. But politicians use that precisely to manipulate and divide people. And, and that's why I would never, ever say yes to it. Because I know that there are people like me, many of them in Kenya, who would never subscribe to an ethnic agenda. And the fact that you have a mother tongue really does not make you any special or different from the other guy. Because everything else is the same. People born in Nairobi, born in the cities, people go to the same schools, people whose parents are cross-cultural that you'd never tell. Precisely for that shortcoming is why we could not go beyond the two months of fighting. It is exactly for that reason. Because how much of a Kikuyu are you? Because you're half Maasai, you're half Kikuyu, and your other uncle, or your, well, part of you came from the other community. And so the, the hollowness of that concept of tribalism and manipulation came to the fore too soon, and Kenyans noticed. So it's, it's a card, it's a horse that can't run. It's a card you can't play anymore. The, the question for the camera was, uh, please comment on the security of your ports? Fairly secure. Uh, it's also patrolled by uh, American naval ships in the region, uh, for your information. But we also have some, we still have some bases, the US bases in the region. Uh, I'll not say exactly where, uh, but we, we, we have, not far from where you are. So there are no threats there. We, uh, far from it, actually. Our threats are on our porous borders with Somali where nobody lives and 
where the terrain is harsh and hostile and anybody could, could, could walk in. But we, we man it, we patrol them, aerial patrol. And um, um, we, we have uh, military presence in the region. And we do that also in conjunction with uh, the British and American uh, military. Comment on uh, commerce with respect to uh, the Mombasa. maritime industry. With respect to the maritime Mombasa, yeah. industry, uh, he had mentioned so many exports going to different mm -hmm. countries. I'm, I'm wondering what is your future focus? There? Thank you. Uh, Mombasa serves the entire seven countries in the region. So Northern, Uganda, Northern Tanzania would use the port of Mombasa for import and export. Uganda definitely uses uh, the port. Rwanda, Burundi, the eastern part of the DRC, that's Congo. Southern Sudan and the southern part of Ethiopia. As we are talking, we are opening a second port in Lamu. <coughs> and we're going to build um, an interstate, if you like, it's a closer term for you here, that will run an, a railway line between Lamu, the southern part of Sudan, uh, up to the parts of Uganda, and, and also parts of, of Ethiopia. Because Ethiopia, as you know, is landlocked. Eritrea that used to offer them a port is now an independent state. So they have been pleading with us. In fact, they have already built their railway up to the border. They've been waiting for the Kenyans to join the line. Uh, so that we take it up to Juba. Uh, somebody has a family member in Juba, uh, in this audience I talked to this afternoon, and to the northern part of Uganda. So that will be a major boost uh, for, for that region uh, uh, towards our north. Uh, but the port is, is, is a big, efficient port, has been there uh, uh, forever linked both by rail and by road. And, and uh, I can't, can't remember offhand the tonnage it processes. It's also day and night. It is a 24-hour operation. Um, the question is, are there, uh, is there an increased presence of Chinese, and how does it manifest itself? Yeah. Um, not so much. Uh, not yet. But, but we have Chinese uh, mostly in the road construction and infrastructure, um, but, but not in other, like in other parts of Africa. Yeah, and, and Kenyans, you know, uh, are also very hardworking people. They, they, wanna, they are competitive, Kenyans are competitive. So uh, Chinese will get part of the job, they will get the other half, and you know, everybody's there. But in terms of influx into Kenya, we, we haven't. They, they, and I think Kenyans will give them a run for their money, too. Okay. <laughs> Kenyans, um, I'm, very, I'm very confident uh, with that. What, what areas of your economy promise the greatest growth? Services. Services, services, services. We, we, we are a corridor into a huge region of about uh, 150 million people. Uh, that's within the East African community alone. That's Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi. If you add Southern Sudan, Southern Ethiopia, and the DRC, the number is higher. And services today is a major, major part of our economy. And we intend to uh, improve on those services and remain a regional hub and a le regional leader. Uh, as I said, um, we, we, we are largely the, the hub. If you left South Africa, if you don't get anything in Nairobi, then you have to fly abroad, abroad meaning London or US. But, but we are pretty much a, a regional hub, and that's what we intend to, uh, to do. Even in the ICT, I should have mentioned, all the major uh, ICT companies, the US, have already moved to Nairobi and created regional centers. So we're talking about the Microsoft, Google, 
Oracle, HP, Cisco, the whole lot of them have moved to Nairobi and set up uh, campuses. So services is, is, is our area of growth. Well, how, thank you. How marvelous is your country? Well, it is. <laughs> I need to tell you that the original safari actually started in Kenya. Um, and that's why, precisely why I had arranged that we would have a clip, a five minute video, but it's on our website, which can give you a, 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 a short view of what Kenya is. We are on the equator. Uh, the altitudes are higher than average, which means that it then moderates the temperatures. So you could easily dress the way I am uh, or just walk in a t-shirt in Nairobi. And as you go further to the north, towards our border with Somali, it gets hotter, but uh, we're not talking about humidity here of high something. There would always be some breeze so there's a lot of uh, f fresh air uh, that, that would always be around you, even if the temperatures were high. But Mombasa has the best coastline. I think I've been around, uh, I've traveled around the world. Um, <coughs> white sands, warm waters. I know you've got great beaches, but the waters uh, <laughs> You can't even dip your feet in it. <laughs> uh, Mombasa is great. Uh, just to let you know, the, the British love it. Of course, you know our history with the British. They came there and they thought they had found another part of Scotland <laughs> <laughs> and called it the White Islands. And they could never imagine that one day they would leave those islands. In fact, they would say that maybe after 999 years, you know the mystical 99 of lease of land, maybe after 999 years, they would consider they loved it that much. And the Italians charter planes every season. In fact, much of the coastline is settled by Italians. Uh, they're even going to run for uh, a member of parliament. Again, the vested interest I talked about in, in our election process. So, so it's, a, it's a, and Lamu, most Americans who have been to Lamu love it. Uh, Lamu is a coastal island off the coast of Somali. Of course, it's all beaches. I mean, uh, sand, sandy, beautiful. It's also historic because it's a 12th, 13th century um, structures, Arabic, Hispanic, Portuguese structures, uh, that, that's totally different from upcountry Kenya. So it's a beautiful place. We also take vacations there as locals. We take vacations in Mombasa, where there would be no ties and no <laughs> short, uh, uh, pants, and you just walk on the beaches. So we love it there beautiful country. Thank you so very much for listening to me and uh, thank you for coming.